Perfect. Okay, well, welcome everyone to our fifth Ask Me Anything session from the UQ AI Tori. Uh, my name is Caitlin Curtis, and I'm from the UQ School of Business uh, and the Center for Policy Features, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. And um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land that where we're meeting today, uh, the Yagra and Turbal people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge such a long and continuous connection to country. And this afternoon, we are so honored to have our esteemed globally recognized guest, Dr. Vishal Sika, who I will introduce properly in just a moment. We are so lucky to have him here. He's flown in for overseas, from overseas uh, to be the keynote speaker in our um, AI Collaboratory Showcase event um, yesterday. Um, and he's graciously agreed to um, be with us for one hour only. This is your hour to ask these questions. Um, and then he will have to go at four. Um, and I think we're going to have a fantastic discussion. Just a little background. The um, Ask Me Anything series is brought to you by the UQAI Collaboratory. You can learn more at our website. Um, so, so please check it out. The, the, the idea of these events is to raise awareness about AI research here at UQ and bring together different perspectives around the research so we can create new connections and collaborations. Uh, we will have an upcoming session September, October around chatbots, so please check the website um, for that. Um, and if you have suggestions for future Ask Me Anything topics, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Um, today's session will be 60 minutes. Uh, for those of you joining us online, if, we, if I could ask if you could um, please turn your microphones off uh, for the time that we're talking, and then you'll be able to, if you have questions, just drop them into the chat, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so we'll start off with your questions that you pre-submitted. I've got them here. There are some really good questions in here. I will try to get to as many as possible. Um, and then um, the last 15, 20 minutes or so, we will have time for live questions or the ones that you put in the chat. So to get started, it's my honor and privilege to introduce- You're gonna read the whole thing? Dr. Michelle Sika. Uh, the introduction. Yeah. Um, it, it, well, it is uh, an amazing bio. Okay, go for it. <laughs> He's a globally recognized innovator and business leader um, who uh, champions the transformative power of technology to address global challenges. He's the founder and CEO of uh, Binary Systems Incorporated, a startup company that provides advanced software service and services in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Previously, he was the CEO and managing director of Infosys Limited. Uh, and um, before that, he was at SAP, a multinational software company where he served on the executive board from 2010 to 2014. He is, uh, I, I encourage you to check out his bio on the registration page because uh, it's, it, it's uh, very impressive. He's also on the supervisory board of BMW Group and the advisory council for the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, among other roles. And I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, so, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I'll stop here. Um, but I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So to start things off, um, I'll uh, start with a question from LeQuinn from Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, how is AI impacting people's lives? Can you please give some real world applications of AI? And I just maybe wanna bundle it with this other question from Anissa in Business Economics and Law. Where would we be without AI today? So if AI went on strike, what would be the impact in our daily lives? What's the significance of AI already? I think that's what they're getting at. Well, that's a great question. Um, so AI as a field, um, is quite old. Um, it started in 1956. Um, John McCarthy came up with the name artificial intelligence in order to, uh, when he wrote for funding for a summer workshop. And uh, so, so the field goes back then and arguably even before that. Um, so for those decades, there has been a lot of work um, most of, a lot of fields came out of it, robotics, um, 
expert systems, object-oriented programming, uh, many fields that we sort of, back in the day, Nils Nilsson, who was one of the pioneers of AI, used to say that when a subfield of AI becomes legitimate, it no longer calls itself AI. <laughs> that was when AI was sort of not as, not quite as red hot as it is these days. Um, but for example, credit card approvals have long used AI systems. The first AI system for credit card transactional authorization was put in place by American Express in 1989. Um, and uh, so these kinds of systems, uh, truth maintenance systems or constraint satisfaction systems for planning logistics by big ships and container trucks and so forth. These have been going on for decades as well. Um, sort of 10 years ago, there was this um, breakthrough uh, coming out of deep learning. So a lot of people had been studying deep learning. Um, Jan Lekun uh, did this work on convolutional neural networks in the late 90s. Um, and um, a lot of other people worked on language processing using deep neural networks, starting again also in the late 90s. But in 2012, a particular system called AlexNet um, improved uh, over human performance in image recognition. And um, so that was uh, Fei Fei Li and her team had put together a, a big data set of images called ImageNet. And AlexNet, in 2012 beat human performance on ImageNet. Um, and that sort of really um, opened up this field. And uh, ever since then, the number of applications has exploded. Uh, so every time you use a Google search or a Bing search, um, every time you, know, you talk to Siri or Alexa or any of these systems, or uh, when we do log into an iPhone with facial recognition, there are deep neural networks running in the back. And so these applications are pervasive. Um, they are basically in every walk of life. Every time you scroll a TikTok page, um, just for you alone, about 35, 40 AI models run to figure out what the next page is that is going to be displayed to you. Um, and that happens for more than a billion users worldwide. So, and every one of those users has Yesterday in the talk, I mentioned that there must be a couple of billion models. Uh, I learned last night as I was researching that the number of models that TikTok uses is in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 billion. Um, there are 30 to 40 models per user. Um, and so, yeah, it is, <laughs> it is everywhere. So if somehow you could magically remove AI from our lives, yeah, most of our modern life would, would stop. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question from Marina from Business Economics and Law. What will be the most significant AI developments and impacts in the next five to 10 years? Um, Hassan uh, from, from Engineering um, and Information Technology. What do you think would be the biggest achievement in AI in the next 10 years? And then Daisy, uh, what's the impact? Uh, uh, well, I'll leave that one next. What about the next five to 10 years? Um, that's a great question. So if you look at the trajectory over the last uh, several years, the we can see a few things. Um, uh, things are advancing. So we have sort of been used to Moore's law, which is doubling every two years. But in AI, arguably things are uh, growing even faster than that. Uh, so if you look at certain parameters, like the size of data sets or uh, number of amount of computing being applied to data sets or the size of AI models or the number of AI models in, in production. Uh, these numbers are all increasing exponentially uh, and increasing faster than the Moore's law uh, exponential curve. Uh, for example, the one of the measures that people use is the number of hyperparameters in uh, language models. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Oh, good, okay. Um, yeah, we've got a mix of people uh, from, from across faculties. We've got uh, science, medicine, humanities, but there are quite a few. That, no, that's very good. <laughs> because know. you know, you want to make sure that people understand what you're saying. Like hyperparameter what? <laughs> the, uh, 
So the number of uh, parameters in large language models um, is increasing quite dramatically. Um, back in 2018, Google released BERT, which had something like 170 million parameters. And last month they released Palm, which has 540 billion parameters. So this is 3000 times bigger in four years. Um, similarly, the number of, uh, the amount of GPU computing that NVIDIA's processors process is increasing. It is something like 5X per year. Some people call it um, Wang's law, Jensen Wang, the founder of NVIDIA. It's 5X increase per year. So if you project that forward, you could assume in the next five years, um, massive language models with multi-trillion parameters will be around. Um, the size of data sets will be bigger, 10 to 100 times bigger than what we have now. Um, the number of applications of AI will be significantly larger. So there are all of these kinds of things that you can project, sort of project out. Uh, I believe that uh, all that is interesting, but it kind of misses the point. Uh, I think what I would love to see as a, you know, lifelong AI researcher, um, I would like to see advances in some of the fundamental techniques, like reasoning, like articulation, like explainability, like uh, the ability to understand and for the AI to articulate uh, what is in it, um, why it makes these decisions, uh, to be able to do this kind of introspection or reflection, which is common in other areas in computer science. Um, you know, most of the, like Python that people program in is a reflective language. The reflection is built into Python. JavaScript has reflection. Java has reflection. Uh, Lisp obviously had reflection. AI does not have reflection. Uh, and, and yet, you know, we all have, in fact, we have abilities to reflect on our own activities at multiple levels, if you ask us, you know, what are you doing right now? We are having a question and answer session about, about this stuff and so on. So um, you can try an interesting experiment with Siri or with Alexa about this, and you'll find, you immediately see the limitations of it. Like you can ask Siri, what's the weather like tomorrow? And it will tell you the weather tomorrow. And then you say, what about the day after? And it's like, what about the day after? Because it has no ability to keep a conversation or hold a context of a conversation. So this ability to hold a context or impart a context um, is woefully missing uh, in AI. The ability to explain, it's like you say, what is the weather tomorrow? And it says, you know, what the weather is. And so why? And it's like, why what? <laughs> you should try some of these experiments. You would have a five with a five-year-old and you understand that they sort of understand the, what is behind the curtain, whereas even these super advanced systems have actually no idea. Um, so I would love to see more advances in those things. There's a lot of people working on those, fortunately. That's the good news. The bad news is that not enough of the main mainstream of AI is working on this. So I wish um, you know, more of the mainstream was working on that. It's really interesting. And sort of bringing, making me think of this question that we got from Jackie in uh, Engineering Architecture Information Technologies. Uh, because we know that AI doesn't have emotions, but can a machine become truly intelligent without any motives or emotions? Well, um, they, I think the, the question that I would ask is, can we make a machine that is intelligent without motives or emotions. Um, so I think in a, in a sense, uh, these, these systems, these machines, they are not dropping out of the sky. We are building them. People are building them, people just like us. Um, and so I think part of the issue that I see in AI is that far too few people understand what it is. Um, far too few people are building it. Um, and, you know, Steve Jobs once said that the important thing in life is to remember that everything around you was built by people who are no superior to you. And so you can do the same thing. Um, and it's, it's not like some high priests sprinkled some holy water on a few people and said, you will build AI systems and only these people are allowed to build AI systems. We can all build AI systems. Anyone can build AI system. In fact, 
it would be awesome if we were living in a world where several billion people were building AI system. Um, we have unfortunately right now, by my estimation, less than a million people, one million, to be generous, who are able to um, build AI systems. In fact, um, actually that one million number is the number of people who could use TensorFlow or PyTorch or R or Scikit-learn or whatever and build you an application. If you say, hey, here is the data, here is this machine, and these are the failures in the machine. Can you help me build a model that predicts the next time this machine is going to fail? And I was standing there making a phone call, watching that thing mixing concrete. There is, you can see that there's a machine over there. And that's an incredibly hard machine to repair when it fails, right? You can easily build an AI model that looks at what this machine has been doing and predict when it is going to fail next. So you can have a service person available when it is going to fail or preemptively repair that thing when it is going to fail. So it continues to work, whatever it is doing. I don't know what they are building over there, Jazia. This is a, are they putting up a new building or something? They're draining a lake. Yeah, that, that thing is like <laughs> some very serious cement mixing is going on over there. Um, and I mean, you just imagine if that thing fails, what happens then, right? So you can build that. So number of people who build models like that, that is a, is a million. This is not a million people who could explain to you what an LSTM is or you know what's the difference between how, how BERT works versus how BART works. And these are, you know, BERT and BART, it sounds like children's cartoons, but they are actually very serious natural language recognizing systems, one built by Google, the other built by Facebook. Um, and, but the number of people who can explain to you how BERT works and how it is different than BART or GPT, uh, is probably 30,000, 40,000 out of what, 7.8 billion people. So, so this has to change. And uh, I think when that changes, then questions like this will sort of become uh, interesting curiosities that people will be able to answer on their own. But otherwise, we tend to, when we don't understand something, we tend to, you know, become afraid of it or we tend to treat it as religion um, and can a machine ever become intelligent well where are the machines coming from we are building them so can we make an intelligent machine i think that's a alan k once said that point of view is worth 80 iq points if you switch your point of view from the point of view of making these things then uh, it becomes uh, a lot more interesting so you've given us quite a lot of numbers and that is making me think of a question that we got from Tia in the business economics and law. Um, what about diversity in AI? Um, and maybe also how if we, uh, some pathways to improve that. It is, uh, it is in incredibly bad. It is, first of all, access to AI is already really, really bad. And then within that diversity is much worse. So these million people that I mentioned, I can guarantee you they don't reflect humanity as a whole. Half of those people are not women. Um, and the minorities are not adequately represented in that, uh, in that group. So it's a really bad situation. There is a, no way to, we suffer from that in my company, you know, we made a very deliberate, mindful effort to hire more women, hire more minorities. We have 25% of our technical staff, R&D staff is, is women today, um, which seems like a lot. It is a lot by the industry standards of the industry, but overall, if you think about it, we are not happy. You know, it doesn't reflect the world. Um, there is only one solution to that, which is to have more access to education, more education, more access to education. And if we create more people who are, um, you know, aware of AI techniques and have access to education in this, then we will um, address that. It takes a while to do it that way. It will take years, but that is a much more sustainable way. Uh, and I think that's what needs to be done. We sponsor uh, some things in this area. We sponsor our own education for women and minorities, uh, education in AI. So in a small way, that contributes to it. The um, 
I mean, I mentioned roughly 1 million AI aware engineers, people who can build an AI system. Um, the total number of programmers in the world, com computer, like coders, people who could program, not AI, but anything. That number, if you are generous, is about 50 million. Um, if you count people who write Excel macros or people who could program a algorithmic trading system on Wall Street or people who can do a actuarial calculation in some insurance system, even if they may not have learned Python programming or whatever, just the number of people who can write code is about 50 million, which is roughly half a percent of the world's population. And my wife is on the board of uh, uh, an organization called Code.org, which is the largest uh, organization to build computing to the world, um, especially to underprivileged people and all that. And she has this statistic that back in the dark ages, 6% of the world's population could read and write. So, and today in the third decade of the 21st century, half a percent of the world can program. And of that half a percent, the minorities and women is a much smaller percentage. So it's a really bad situation. Um, Shadia was telling me that the introductory computing class here has 1,100 students. So that is really good. That is awesome. Um, so I think the more that we demystify these things, the more that we make these things accessible. Um, Anybody who has ever communicated a recipe to somebody else of how to cook something or how to go from one place to another, in effect is writing code. We need to teach these things. It is not like you have to have a certain mathematical brain in order to learn to program. Anybody can do that. Anybody who thinks, uh, Seymour Papad used to say this, that you know, programming is similar to thinking about thinking. Uh, anytime you teach a child how to reason about things, you are kind of doing computer programming. So we need to teach these things. And then AI will hopefully, you know, Code.org does a lot in this area. Uh, they focus a lot on women in computing, uh, minorities in computing. Um, so it is like reading and writing. Um, and today, 86 or 87 percent of the world can read and write. And so, you know, we need to get. Probably, it will not happen in our lifetimes, but hopefully, in our children's lifetimes, 85, 86 percent of the world can program a computer and hopefully half of them can build an AI system. Then in doing that, we can solve this, you know, but it's a pretty, I see it as a pretty bad situation. And so when you have the Economist magazine or Time magazine, you know, big prominent magazines written by very smart journalists, they put a cover like Google's AI has become sentient. And you look at it like, my God, what are they talking about? This is nonsense. And they don't even know that this is nonsense. Um, they, they think that, oh, Waymo has a car running on certain streets in San Francisco. Therefore, autonomous cars are coming everywhere next year. No, they are not coming next year. They are not coming the year after that either. They are not coming for the next several decades. People just don't understand these things. And um, it, is, it is a problem of education. It is a problem of... Uh, access to how to build these systems. It is, uh, and I think that needs to be fixed. It's a wonderful answer and you're in, and so empowering. And we have a lot of students joining us and online and um, uh, thank you for that. And do you have any specific tips? Because we have a few questions, including one from me here in IAT, um, about pathways of getting, the best pathways of getting into the AI field. Yeah, no, there are many. So, you know, Coursera, um, Stanford HAI, I'm sure UQ has it. Um, the um, other online facilities, um, Jeremy Howard has this thing called Fast.ai. Uh, all of these are ways to, to learn. And don't be intimidated by it. Get in there, try to build a simple AI systems. Anything that you were ever curious about predicting, like, is there something in your life that you are interested in predicting? Like, what is the amount of rainfall in the world tomorrow? Or what is the wind speed at a certain place? Or how much money will be there in my checking? Or whatever. Something, how many steps will you walk tomorrow? Or uh, anything that you're interested in predicting, 
go learn some basic class so you can write a thing that lets you predict that thing. And, uh, you know, it, it's very empowering. It's, and it's not hard. It's, you should do it. Uh, that's my advice to people. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> a long time ago, my, my sister-in-law is a dentist and she owns a couple of dental practices in California. So probably 12, 13 years ago, Wasim, you might remember this. I wrote a piece of code for her to predict the collections that she will have the following day. And I was, it was, I was within 1% of it. The next day she called me. She said, my God, how did you know? <laughs> and I, I said, I had these 13 signals and I put them together and this is how I forecast what your thing is going to be tomorrow. And she, she was like, wow, it is like somebody came from the future and told me what, it, what was going to happen. So, you know, it, it, this kind of a thing can be done. It is, it is not hard. It is, uh, uh, anybody can do it. So, switching gears, I have a couple of questions um, that are kind of similar. Um, one from Kevin in business, uh, economics, and law. I research on social media, content moderation, bias data is a problem. How can we solve the data bias problem? And another question from Javan and Iyat. How should people developing AI go about screening data that's being used for training to reduce bias performance? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. I think part of it is, um, having tools that help you analyze the data to see biases in it. Um, and the thing to remember about bias, so when you train an AI system on a piece of data, in the end, that what that AI system does is it basically fits a curve to that data. That's all it does. You have a bunch of data, you say, this is dogs and this is cats and this is everything else. And say, when you recognize it, it says, oh, this is a cat, so no, this is a dog. And it basically iteratively converges on figuring out what you meant by a dog and what you meant by a cat and what you meant by everybody else. That's all it does. Um, and of course, there is a deeper question that does it understand what a dog is? It doesn't. And this does not mean that the AI system has developed an understanding of what a dog is. Uh, it has no idea if it is a paper dog or a metal dog or a living dog or, you know, sleeping dog or whatever. Um, but um, the system will do what you train it to do. And the training that you give it will be from the data that you have. So if the data that you have is biased, the system will become biased. Uh, that's how these techniques work today. So how can you solve this problem? You can solve this by, before you train the model, you can develop tools to understand if there is bias in the data. Uh, do you have more of this versus the other? What percentages of various kinds of entities do you have in the data? Are there things that are skewed in certain directions? This is very easy to do. It's not hard to do this. In, in Shazia Center, she was telling me about one of the initiatives, one of the missions is to be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, and so you should be able to do that. And so that is dealing with the data itself. If you don't have access to the data, but you have access to the model, it is possible to tell from the behavior of the model, whether the model is producing biased responses. For example, you can feed it certain kinds of data on the extremes of your distributions. And then you see how the model behaves on those. You can give it data around the midpoints of your distributions. You can give it data around the edges of your distribution and see how it does. And you can tell, oh, when I give it data that is skewed towards these kinds of measurements, it does not do a good job. So all of these kinds of tools are possible to build. Um, and the philosophical answer here is that we have to have a curiosity to transcend the data before you can look at whether it is biased or not, whether it is uh, a good reflection of the way the world should be, the way the world is or not. You have to have a curiosity to be able to step back and say, what is missing here? And that is our judgment. That is the human judgment that brings uh, that uh, ability. Is We have that ability to see what is not here. Um, and, and therefore we can you know, fix these problems. Mm. 
Thank you. I feel like that would tie really well in with what you said too about bringing diversity into the Oh, absolutely. Workforce. Yes, absolutely. Do the <laughs> folks here have any questions? Oh, yeah. Well, while you're thinking of your question, I have one here. Yeah. Um, what about what's the role of humans in the AI pipeline? The um, that's a great question. What is the role of humans in the AI pipeline? And um, I think clearly, humans are the generally the owners of the business problems. We are the um, people who judge whether the AI system that we are building is good enough or not. Uh, what is it that it is supposed to do? What is it that it is not supposed to do? Is it doing that? To what extent is it doing that? All of these things come from us. Um, there is a, a paradigm within AI called AutoML. I, I think that humans, trained humans, find it difficult enough to build AI models that uh, things like AutoML are, uh, you know, really, at best, really, really early. At worst, they are a step backwards in helping us good, better, um, helping us build better AI models. Um, so all of the judgment comes from humans. All of the, um, the wisdom, the understanding of the boundaries, we do the data curation, um, and, and so on. So the human pipeline, the AI pipeline uh, has to have a, a very serious human oversight and human involvement. But beyond that, I think articulating problems. So one of the things that I learned early on in my career um, was in a seminar like this, I was um, an early student at Stanford and John McCarthy was talking about AI. And he said that Articulating a problem is half the solution. And it was, uh, it was shocking to me that he said that. And his point was that ultimately, maybe 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we'll get to a point where there is an AI system that can do anything that we ask it to do. So in that situation, the ability to ask the right questions becomes the important thing. Uh, and we have that ability because we can look around and see what is missing. Uh, and therefore, articulating a problem, and, and especially in AI, when people apply AI to important problems, like figuring out what problem are you going to apply AI to? What business problem or what important problem needs to be solved that you will apply AI to? Uh, this is a, a very deeply human endeavor. Uh, Understanding, talking to people, business owners, and um, understanding what it is that they want solved. What do they mean by fraud or by money laundering or by predictive failure detection or anomaly detection or this kind of thing? Well, what is it that they mean by this? What happens when these anomalies show up in, in real life and, and, and so on? Um, and then converting that into features that will show up in an AI system and then then constructing those features, engineering those features, and, and so on. So I think that um, having an understanding of what part of a system um, is, is an AI system, and all the stuff around it is, is, the, is, is, the, is human. Uh, I think that's how I see it. So do we have questions from the yeah. audience? Oh, brilliant. Hello, um, my name is Rishi. I'm studying physics at UQ. My main question is like, you spoke before about the necessity for human kind of intervention and, con and some level of control over AI. Who do you see as the founders of the moral and ethical parameters that set that structure? And if we have billions of people one day making AI, how do we control that under those structures? I think, um... I'll answer your question in a uh, slightly, uh, from a slightly different point of view. Recently, there has been a lot of questioning of Facebook. Um, Zuckerberg went in front of Congress and, and all of that. And basically the reaction to 
of the Facebook people, the leadership, including the technical leadership, was, you know, what could we do? We couldn't do anything. Yeah, there was misinformation. People abused the system to spread wrong things, influence elections. What could we do? Um, it is like if this beam fell down and we were like, what the hell? We were in the middle of a seminar and this beam fell down. It was not supposed to fall down. And the people who built this building said, you know, well, what could we do? Yeah, it fell. There was rain. Uh, it's unacceptable. The, every building in the world is built to standards. Uh, every single one. Eight billion people live and work in buildings that are, by and large, okay, there might be some shanty towns or whatever somewhere, but properly put together buildings where billions of people live and work in more than 200 countries are built to standards. They are not only built to standards, an engineer from like Germany or you know Korea could walk in here and somewhere in this building, there must be the plans for this building and they would know what the limits of these beams were, where the electrical systems are, where the plumbing is and the water is and all of that. You don't need to know, you know, Python or heaven forbid, Python programmers have to read C code um, to, in order to understand that. And so why is it that people who put together the how to make buildings were able to solve this problem? And I don't know, millions of people at a minimum around the world know how to make buildings. And they make buildings that generally don't break, you know, when it rains or when there, even when there is an earthquake. Uh, so we have to be able to put together institutions that are able to manage this kind of a thing. Um, AI technology is incredibly powerful. Uh, it is as powerful as nuclear technology or even more perhaps. And yet, by and large, we have been able to contain nuclear technology. Um, there have been three major nuclear accidents, basically, in the last 70 years. Uh, three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. That's it. And even in those three, the loss of life and damage was relatively minor. So I believe that we still have time to get these things right. And it is possible to, it starts with education and demystification, understanding what these technologies are, ensuring that people who build these and put them into public use do it based on standards and uh, policies that are not okay to violate. Uh, and, and it starts from there. Uh, th that's how we can, we can get a handle on this. Thank you. Oh, looks like we have another question, Hassan. Thank you for all the insights. Uh, my name is Hassan Kostravi. I'm an associate professor at UQ. Uh, you mentioned a problem with quite a bit of things is lack of education. I wonder if you have any thoughts of how AI can help us with scaling education and at a, at a cross world. I, I saw a very nice example yesterday of here at UQ, there is a system that is being put together. Oh, That's... oh you are working on <laughs> Well, Was it you that I asked the question to about immersion? Sorry? Did I ask you the question about immersion? I, I wasn't uh, you there, there? Yesterday, okay. but the system. Whoever was doing the demo, I asked them a question. I, um, it's, it's a very good system. It's a, um, they have built a system that uses AI to assist students in learning and grade them and try to get a sense of what the understanding level of the student is and then coming up with the right material and right kinds of questions for it. This is wonderful. Um, I think that we really learn best when we are immersed in something. Uh, we learn best when we close cycles, close loops. Uh, so the sooner we close loops, the better. The more loops we close, the better. I think, you know, you don't learn to fly a plane by watching PowerPoints of flying a plane. Um, the, so you have to get people to fly a plane and you have to get people immersed into the thing where your entire body, your all your senses are immersed into doing that. Generally, doing something does that, like make a system, and then you see how the system works. And so get people to build something, 
and finish that loop and then get them to build something better and then bigger and better and, and so on. And before you know it, they are fluent and what they are doing. And there is still too little of that, you know, too little of doing physics by, I think one of you is a physics, you are a physics student, you're doing physics by reading books on physics that are 100 years old uh, going on, uh, not like doing physics. Um, and so if we can get AI systems to help people do physics or do biology or make things and, and then guide them, be there, um, the sort of the safety harness around them as they do this, that, that will really help scale that. So taking a great teacher and being and having a thousand AI assistants to this great teacher, you could teach you know a hundred thousand students. That would be awesome. Other questions in the audience? Oh. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Rishikesh and I'm working in a, as a data scientist in UQ Business School. My question is, how can we draw a line in between where I can, where we, where we can use AI in research or not? Like what kind of areas we should use AI in research? You mean in your work? At, uh, in no, 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 in general, like, uh, I mean, my context is, will AI ever be a threat to humanity? And in that context, I need to ask whether we should use AI in research or yeah, yeah, of course, it, it, uh, it is already a threat. The misinformation and the amplification of the misinformation is a, is a very big threat to humanity right now. Um, and uh, how to fix that? I think we know how to, we have done, uh, we have built safe, safely built dangerous technologies before. And we have kept them out generally out of the hands of people who should not have these, you know. Um, and similar initiatives, similar practices need to be brought into AI. What we can do at a personal level is uh, under, one of first of all is understand it. I think um, when you read about oh the Google AI has become sentient, don't believe it. Um, go and see, play with it yourself. I guarantee you there are open versions of G not GPT-3, but GPT-2 are available and a lot of these systems are out there. You can play with them. It takes two or three minutes to realize that these systems have absolutely no idea what they are talking about. They are simply regurgitating what they have been trained, even though they have been trained on billions and billions of sentences. Very quickly, you realize that they, yesterday there was a story about apparently the Facebook guys and I know I have picked on them twice already. It's nothing specific about Facebook. Uh, there are many other companies like Facebook. But they had this uh, chatbot that they released. And sure enough, very quickly, it started to make absolutely dangerous and non nonsensical statements, uh, including about their own founder and, and things like that. It was quite hilarious. Um, so there is no substitute to firsthand playing with systems, understanding systems, demystifying systems. And secondly, I think that um, our own establishing our own boundaries on proper use versus improper use or not falling uh, for, um, for the wrong kinds of things, I think we can do that ourselves. Um, and I think that would help a lot. But beyond that, I think really this problem has to be solved by the government. And uh, the governments have to become more aware of uh, of the limitations of these things, the dangers of these things, and so on. We've got a few questions coming in online. I'll just read one from Anonymous. How likely is it that we will build an AI with long-term goals and planning capabilities like humans? If so, what can we do to ensure that AI furthers human values rather than misunderstanding them? Um, yeah, the simple answer is yes, we can. Um, <clears throat> When will we have it? I don't know, uh, not soon, but eventually we will. Um, if you are interested in this uh, type of, these types of questions, I encourage you to read the work of uh, a very dear friend of mine, whose name is Stuart Russell. He is a professor at uh, the U University of California, Berkeley. And he is my academic um, brother. We had the same PhD advisor. 
uh, he has written about these kinds of things and he has written a book about this as well and talks about how to establish how to give the right goals to ai and 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 so on uh, and he's done a very thoughtful analysis of of this whole field um and um, but here for the purposes of this talk i think the simp simplest way to do it is that the people who are the architects of these systems which are people like us have to set the right goals. And just like every one of us was raised by parents, every one of us, most of us, almost every one of us will ultimately become a parent. And we raise children and we give them goals and we give them values and we give them principles and do's and don'ts and all of these things. It's the same kind of thing. And it, again, we should sort of stop thinking that these are systems that are somehow dropping out of the sky and some super entity out there is building these. We are the ones who are building these, and we have to build these. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Afnan, and I work in Italy. Uh, my understanding is that academia and commercial industry are two parallel uh, streams that use AI. Uh, so, I know about the academia, they do a lot of lit review and that kind of thing. How does, how does uh, a commercial company uh, build its knowledge base for AI and decides what they're going to use and what is their learning process? Most of them are going through that right now. We have sort of had in the last 10 years, uh, especially among the big technology companies, a kind of a mad rush to accumulate as much AI talent as possible, accumulate as much data as possible, and then throw massive amounts of computing at that and, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But other companies are slowly starting to adopt AI. My own estimation is that there is sort of 20 tech giants which have a different sort of perspective on AI. Um, there are about maybe 200 or so companies that are advanced in their use of AI um, in, um, uh, in how, how many models they have in production, how much um, data they collect and, and all of this kind of thing and how many data scientists they have working for them. So they have a slightly different horizon and a slightly different perspective of different maturity. And then there is everybody else. And generally, everybody else is in this bucket of they have a few AI projects happening, some people that they have hired, they generally don't have a chief AI officer or somebody in charge of supervising or having an overview of AI across the organization. And they are starting to do this, this type of a thing. So it is all, um, right now we are in a situation where there isn't a systematic way to build a point of view on AI to build a set of principles. CEOs generally are curious. They take executive classes, you know, at various institutions. I hope UQ has something like this. Um, the, you know, it would be a very good service to bring CEOs and other executives in here and have them go through a day long or two day long class, or even a half a day fly by session so that they at least are armed with the important questions that they have to ask. Uh, this would be a, still a very good idea. Um, but yeah, so you have companies that have thousands of AI engineers working for them and have relatively clear ideas of what they are trying to get done with it. Um, and then, but vast majority of companies, like vast, vast majority, 95 plus percent, don't have an idea yet. Great question. Thank you for that. Um, basically, I was going to ask, like, with the broad deployment of AI that poses a threat of individuals losing the privacy to their data, so how do you propose a solution to that while maintaining security and innovation as well as a broad use for individuals? So the, the European Union has taken a good step set of set steps in this direction to deal with people's privacy. Um, and um, I think they, they need to do more 
obviously, but they have already, um, at least they have started and they have taken some good set of steps in this direction. Um, more needs to be done there. Um, maybe it is, it comes down to, is it possible for us to, like for example, generally speaking, I was critical of Facebook earlier. I think generally speaking, Apple does a good job with privacy. Um, partly because their business model is not based on selling ads and things like that, but it is based on selling actual devices. And so they generally do a good job of maintaining people's privacy and, and things like that. Um, so so it, is, it is possible to do this. It is possible to both for companies to themselves come up with ways of, of dealing with this and for governments to establish frameworks and policies uh, around that. And, and both of those need to happen. From the point of view of us as users, uh, I think that, I still think that far too few of us understand, you know, where our data goes or that, you know, there is a rule in Silicon Valley that if you are not paying for the product, then you are the product. Um, <laughs> And so we generally don't realize that often we are the product. <laughs> Thank you. We, we have a question here online. Uh, I don't know who it's from. Um, about mission critical applications of AI. So do you see AI uh, being adopted into mission critical applications like healthcare, self-driving, et cetera? Yeah, um, still very, very early. Um, not really. Um, they are like even facial recognition on the phones it has a backup. Like if the if it doesn't work, you're wearing a mask or or whatever, and um, it fails, and then you enter your passcode, and then it then it works. And so um, the interesting fact about the deep learning based AI is that most of the applications that are still that are used productively today are uh, they are mission critical to many companies, to their businesses, but they are not mission critical in the sense that like safety critical human systems depend on them. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> we are not yet at that at that point. Otherwise, bad things would happen. Um, the uh, so, for example, you know, when you talk to Siri and it gives you the wrong answer, it's not such a big deal. <laughs> the um, or you get a wrong answer on Google or. You have to do a three extra searches to get to what you are looking for. It doesn't matter so much. So fortunately, we are still at at that point. Uh, it is getting uh, it is getting better. So, for example, in radiology, um, uh, automatic scanning of X rays and MRI scans and these kinds of things, uh, this is happening more and more. But again, uh, one of the good things. So you you guys have been asking about. Um, you know, how do you do these regulatory stuff and all that? And medicine is one area where actually this is happening and it is very encouraging. So for example, the Society of Radiologists has made it mandatory for radiologists to understand, to take classes in machine learning in order to renew their licenses. So they feel that enough radiology is now happening using AI, even if it is still, finally the decision making is in the hands of a doctor, a human doctor, um, there is a lot going on by you with using uh, scans and all that, that they want the radiologists to take classes in machine learning before they can renew their license. And I think this is a really wonderful development and a very needed development. I think every field where AI starts to show up should have this um, in financial industry and in insurance and in, manufacturing, any of these fields where it starts to show up should do similar sort of thing. Um, Thank you. It, oh, we've got time for one, one last question. Lucky last, otherwise Thank it's you. gonna be mine. Oh, yep. Uh, I had a question. I was wondering, uh, as you mentioned, um, it's not that far future, uh, whatever we ask uh, AI, uh, they will answer. Uh, they will uh, have a response for that. Uh, what about that time that AIs can uh, are able to develop AIs? 
or is it even controllable anymore? You can put limitation for humans, but uh, I think I get asked this kind of question a lot. Um, when will we get the singularity? And when will AI produce AI and, and this type of a thing? The um, we can look at it as oh, 50 years from now there will be an AI that will produce another AI. I could say that. I could say 100 years from now this will happen. In the year 2122, by the 11th of August, there will be an AI that, produ time. that produces another AI. Of course, none of us will know whether I was right or not. Um, the point is, what I would like to um, emphasize to you is that that question is irrelevant. I think if you brought somebody here from the 18th century and they were sitting in this room, they would not believe what they saw. And yet we are arguably as human, no less human, no more human than they were. Um, and seriously, like in the time of my grandparents, they would not believe that right now, our, we feel that we are talking to people in this room, but there are people elsewhere listening to this and participating in this conversation. This is miraculous. Um, the ability to just FaceTime, like while I've been talking, my wife is messaging me um, because I need to go. Um, these things are, are miraculous. Who, who produced this iPhone, right? This is a thing that was produced. A bunch of machines produced these iPhones. Uh, a, in fact, a bunch of machines produce the machines that produce this iPhone. Um, so like that, that thing I was talking to you about, who made that? It wasn't a bunch of people who got together, welded the metal. And Some other machines produce that machine. In the right context, it doesn't matter that an AI will produce another AI. Already machines are producing other machines. This building, these beams that we were talking about, those screws, they were all built by machines. Um, so you see what I'm saying? I, I think that um, I would strongly advise everyone who has this kind of a question about, oh, when will we have a machine that is able to do X, Y, and Z, is to go and start building a machine that does some fraction of that X, Y, and Z today and see what it is like. And it will demystify it for you. Uh, you know, Actually, yeah, machines are making machines now, but uh, it's they, they are working as like technicians. A, AI is about thinking, you know, it's a bit different. Yeah. And I think they can think even much better than us. Because yeah, these, these distinctions between what is thinking and what is not thinking become a lot clearer when you start thinking about thinking and when you start building thinking systems. Well, that, that brings us to the end of our session. That was a fantastic discussion. I want to really thank you for your generously sharing your time and your insights with us, Vishal. Thank you all for your fantastic questions. And thank please you, join me thanking our wonderful guest, Vishal Tika. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thanks for the excellent questions.